people said. Amen. You may be seated. Do you spend too much time at church? Don't you wish the church had a reward system where you could swipe in and earn points? Thanks to Jesus Junk International, you can with our latest product, the church card. Not only am I a county, but I'm also a man, which means I love football. As soon as we started developing the church card, I knew I would never miss a Sunday game again. Yes! My pastor started adding all these services and activities and small groups and conferences and, whew, I thought I was never gonna see another reality show. Church almost ruined my life until I started racking up a Messiah mile. As head of research and development, my team has found a way to track Messiah miles and maximize them for full redeemability. Messiah miles are a way to reclaim a portion of the time you spend at church. Each day you spend at church is logged onto your church card account. Now, I get to choose what I do on Sunday morning, which is nothing. That's right. You can get enough points to cover all those late night Netflix binges. But that's not all. We've enhanced the entire church card structure with the promotional genius of the Trinity Triangle of Triumph. Now, for every person who you sign up, you'll gain a small percentage of their miles to use as your own. It's called the Discipleship Downtime Initiative. <sighs> When your recruits attend a service, you get time off for their good behavior. The best part is you don't have to be there to earn your points. Imagine going to brunch with the girls. Finally beating that game. Or sleeping in. While at the same time, vlogging Messiah Miles for Jesus Fest next weekend. I haven't been to church in three years. The church card. It's never been easier to be a Christian. but it's a joke that's steeped in reality. Because we've all seen the ways that some ministries have used slick marketing techniques in order to go and promote their ministries. The commercialization of Christmas and Easter. The televangelists that you can turn on on late night TV who are selling you prayer cloths and anointed vials of healing water. Various ways in which the gospel has been monetized. Religious hucksterism, it's not an innovation. It's actually an ancient heresy right out of the devil's playbook. And in our text today, we are going to see Jesus resist that false religion. Today's message is entitled, Jesus and the Money Changers. And we're going to be looking in Matthew chapter 21 at verses 12 through 17. But I'd like to start off with a little story. Almost 24 years ago, when Cindy, Eric, and I landed in Fornaboo Airport in Oslo to visit my family, one of our first tasks was to get local currency, Norwegian krona, or crowns as we would call them. And I thought that it was going to be difficult. I thought we were going to have to find some kind of a money exchange. Because growing up in New York City, a very cosmopolitan town with people who travel from all over the world, I remember walking through the streets of Manhattan with my grandfather and seeing all of these exchange places where you could bring your foreign currency and convert it to local currency. So that's what I was expecting, and I was a little bit uh, concerned about how quickly we would be able to go and convert our currency. But it was so much easier than that. Not being world travelers, 
Cindy and I were shocked at the time, and remember now, we're going back about 25, 26 years ago, or not quite, uh, 25 years ago. We were shocked to learn that we could just go to an ATM and we could withdraw money from our accounts. We could withdraw dollars and out of the slot came Norwegian crowns. It was that simple. And outside of typical ATM fees, like we paid even if you were at home and you used a machine that wasn't connected to your bank, outside of that and one additional conversion fee that was pretty reasonable, it was fair, it was simple, it was convenient. That was my first experience with money changers. And I'd have to say it was altogether positive. It was great because it was convenient and fair. However, what Jesus would experience as he walked into the temple was way too convenient, inappropriately so. And the more we study it, we'll see that it was not at all fair. You see, his experience with the money changers is emotionally charged. It stirs his righteous indignation. We will seldom see this angry side of Jesus more than we do in his interaction with the money changers. Now, today we're going to look at the second time that Jesus cleansed the temple. And this time, the consequences would be far greater. He knew this. He knew what it would cost him to do what he did, but he also knew that it had to be done. And we're going to see how many prophecies Jesus fulfilled as he powerfully demonstrated his zeal for his father's house. And the first thought I'd like to share is cleansing of the temple. The cleansing of the temple. Look with me in verses 12 through 13. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. Now, I referred to this as the second cleansing of the temple because the Apostle John describes an earlier incident. And we know that these are not the same story just put in two different places because they occur in very different seasons John describes something that happens at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, and here we're in Passion Week. We're in Jesus' final week. In a sense, the two temple cleansings, they form a bracket around Jesus' ministry. They mark for us the beginning and the end. Now, all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all describe this second cleansing. Now, Luke's account is very brief. You can go and read it. You'll get through it really quickly. Matthew and Mark are very similar in the details that they include. However, there is one very considerable difference between Matthew's account and Mark's account. And it has to do with the timing of this event. When did Jesus go to the temple? Our text in Matthew 21 suggests that Jesus makes his triumphal entry He is received by Israelites as their king, although fickly so. And then it seems like he immediately goes into the temple and deals with the money changers. However, as we look at Mark chapter 11, we see a different chronology. In verse 12, we read, On the following day when they came from Bethany, and then in verse 15, the narrative continues, And he entered the temple. And then it describes the very events that we're seeing in Matthew's gospel. We have seen this before. Once again, Mark is preserving the chronology of events, the proper timing of what happened and what happened next. Matthew is taking a more thematic approach. He is driving home the theme of Jesus' urgency in fulfilling the prophecies of Scripture. He wants to take us from the triumphal entry right into the cleansing of the temple in order that we can strongly feel Jesus' urgency and purpose. So it would seem that Jesus makes his triumphal entry, but then goes and travels two miles away to Bethany. And it may seem odd to us as we now begin to study the Passion narratives 
the story of Jesus' death and resurrection, that we're going to see him making all these back and forth trips. Keeps going back to Bethany, coming back to Jerusalem. But in order to understand that, we have to remember that this is Passover season, a very special time. There were about two million pilgrims who had come to Jerusalem just for the Passover. The city has exploded with this short-term growth. And you know, as I thought about it, I saw another bracketing within the history of the Gospels. Because the Gospels begin with Jesus' birth and the fact that there was no room for him at the inn. And here we find him in his final week of ministry, and once again, there is no room for him in any of the inns of Jerusalem. So he stays with his friends, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. So the events that we're exploring today take place on Monday of Holy Week. Now the events during Jesus' last week center around two key locations, the Mount of Olives and the Temple. And I've included some pictures today because I think we have very different pictures in our mind, especially when it comes to the Holy Land we have this mental image, but it's often nothing like what it really was. You see, the Mount of Olives is very near the Temple Mount. Do you notice in the picture how you can always see the walls of Jerusalem? During Holy Week, there are times that Jesus will retreat to Bethany, but at other times, like following the Last Supper, we find Jesus and his disciples sleeping in the Garden of Gethsemane upon the Mount of Olives. As you think about Jesus praying in that garden, those agonizing prayers, look at that scene on the screen. His doom is right before him. He could never block it from his mind. The other mental picture that I think we need to correct is our picture of the temple. You see, the temple was initially very small. The second temple also was the one that replaced the Temple of Solomon. After the Solomonic Temple had been destroyed and the people were carried away into captivity, the captives were then allowed to return, but they had meager supplies and they built the best temple that they could, but it was not very good. In fact, the old timers who had seen the original Solomonic Temple, when they saw this temple, the young people threw a party. The old folks all cried. It was so lacking in glory. But King Herod, though an Idumean, though half Edomite, though not a sincere practicing Jew, King Herod was a builder, and he was dissatisfied with the condition of this temple. And he began a huge building project. Many years ago, I visited the Washington Cathedral. And I don't know if you've ever seen that structure, but when I saw it, I learned that it would not be done for another 120 years. Well, I've ticked off a few years since then. But it is so enormous a project that it was going to take more than a century to build it. Well, something very similar happens with Herod's temple. Herod begins this building project a few years before his death, not very far away from the time of Jesus' birth. However, it was not completed until 64 AD. He expanded it. He went and put Roman marble all through it. He made the temple a grand edifice. And when it was completed in 64 AD, six decades after his death, it would be destroyed by the Romans just six years later. Only the Western Wall remains today. You've heard it called the Wailing Wall. It is a very holy site for Orthodox Jewish people. But this picture on your screen is a scale model. Because since only one wall remains of the temple, we can't show you pictures of what the temple really looked like. So anytime you look in a Bible study curriculum or look in some kind of an encyclopedia, this is what you'll see. And because it's a scale model, we get this very small picture, this miniature picture in our minds. So let me see if I can use some terms that speak to us. Because I realize that terms like cubits and stadia don't mean a whole lot to us. 
So let's talk football fields, right? We're a football town, we get football. The temple complex was about 35 football fields in square footage. Does that give you a little bit of a picture? The temple complex covered one-sixth of the total land of the city of Jerusalem, the ancient city. That's how big this temple was. Now, there were several inner courts in the temple. There was the court of the women. It was open to both men and women. And there were some very important things in the court of the women. For example, remember when we see people like the Apostle Paul who make a Nazarite vow, and they go and they shave their hair off, and then they offer it at the temple? Well, the altar upon which they would burn that hair as a symbol of the completion of their vow, that was in the court of the women. Also, when a person was healed or just naturally recovered from a skin disease that had been deemed to possibly be a leprosy, when they went to the priest in order to be declared cleansed, that took place in the court of the women. So then after the court of the women is a court that is called the court of the Israelites. It is one step closer to where the holy altar is. But it was also called the men's court because no women were allowed beyond the court of the women. And then there is a place that is even closer yet to the altar, and that, quite understandably, was the court of the priests. But the largest court of all was the court of the Gentiles. This was the place where the Gentiles, those who were not Jewish, were allowed to come into the temple and to learn something of the God of Israel. And of the temple's 35 football fields, the court of the Gentiles that wrapped around the whole perimeter was 19 of those 35 football fields. Let me speak to you farmers for a moment in your terms. The court of the Gentiles was about 25 acres. So I think when we picture Jesus and the money changers, we need to scale up our image in order to get an accurate view of the full scope of the chaos that Jesus encountered in the temple. Now, the money changers were in the court of the Gentiles, but they weren't always there. You see, in the past, the money changers and the sellers of sacrificial animals were spread out across the Mount of Olives. They were outside of the temple precinct, and all of the noise and the chaos and the commerce was not inside the temple. It was not until 30 AD that this changed. What's the significance of 30 AD? Anybody? What was that? Jesus begins his earthly ministry, right? And the high priest at that time is a familiar name to us, Caiaphas. And Caiaphas moved the operation of the money changers and all of these other merchants inside the court of the Gentiles. This is the same Caiaphas that we will meet in the trial of Jesus. So I want you to pause for a moment and notice the timeline. Jesus' first temple cleansing corresponded to the timing of this move. He responded immediately to Caiaphas' decision to desecrate the temple and move the money changers inside. Jesus cleansed the temple because it was God's house, but it had become more of a bazaar than a house of prayer. And in our text today, we see that Jesus' actions three years earlier did not have a lasting effect. I suspect the money changers were back and open for business the very next day. So now Jesus comes in. It is three years later, and the money changers and all of the merchants are back and I'll use this phrase, Jesus goes postal. He goes and he makes a whip. He starts whipping people. He starts overturning the tables of the money changers. He's opening up all of the pens that have the pigeons in them. The rams are running wild. But once again, I want us to scale up our understanding. Imagine this level of chaos across 25 acres of expanse filled with the clanging of coins, the bleeding of sheep, the squawking of pigeons, and the shouts of desperate and frustrated merchants. 
Now let's take another look at verse 13. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. Now, the first part of this verse needs very little explanation. How could you possibly pray in that kind of an environment? Bear in mind that this court of the Gentiles was the evangelistic arm of the temple. This was the place where people who did not yet know the God of Israel could come and learn of that God, hear those stories that we read in the Hebrew scriptures in our Old Testament. This was the place where they could connect with the true God in prayer. Yet as the Jewish leadership increasingly came to despise the Gentiles and call them dogs and treat them like dogs, they lost their evangelistic purpose. In the book of Isaiah, we are given their purpose in chapter 42. The Jews were called to be a light of revelation to the Gentiles. Their job was to understand God's law, live out God's law, and share God's law with the Gentile people of the world who had not received God's law. That was their purpose. But they came to hate their mission field. And I want to encourage you, let's not lose the obvious application for us. Do we look to create an atmosphere where people can explore the claims of Jesus? Or are we tempted at times to make the sanctuary feel a little bit more like a noisy stadium? You know, I bring this out because there are so many ways in which my walk with Christ has just blossomed under the teaching and ministry of an evangelical church. This has been my home now for over 40 years. But as you know, I was raised Catholic, and I remember the feeling of walking into Mass, into that quiet and still and very solemn atmosphere. And I think that there is a lesson for us. As evangelical Protestants, there is a challenge I want to bring to us that we be careful that we always leave room for the seeker to come in and find a quiet place where they can connect with God. Well, let's look at the second part of verse 13. But you make it a den of robbers. Now, this requires a little bit more explanation. There were good purposes for both the money changers and the sellers of sacrificial animals. You see, most of the coins contained pagan images. They had images of any one of a number of the Caesars, like Tiberius Caesar. And God's word has a lot to say about graven images, that these are like idols. So it was a problem. No observant Jew was going to go and bring coins with those kind of images into the heart of the temple complex. So the money changers exchanged those coins for Tyrian silver coins, coins from Tyre in Phoenicia, coins that have been specially designed to have no such pagan markings on them. And there was also a very real need for the sellers of animals for sacrifice. We've seen how people would go and travel from Galilee, and we've discussed this as we've studied this gospel how they would often go around the Gentile territories and they would travel down into Jerusalem through the Gentile Decapolis, through Perea, across the Jordan River, and then to Jerusalem. And depending upon where you lived in Galilee, it was 90 to 120 miles. Now, some of you folks have livestock. How well do they travel? Would you like to take them on a 120-mile trip how about if you were going and you were taking them by foot? I sometimes can't stand walking my dog, and I love her. But she's got to sniff at every plant and every other awful thing that exists on the road. Just to go around the block can be a half an hour of my life. Imagine taking livestock 120 miles. That's the easy trip. Remember that the Jewish community has been scattered. And only a small fraction ever returned from Babylon. The Jewish community in Babylon is much bigger than the Jewish community in Israel. Imagine taking livestock from Babylon. 
There's a huge Jewish community in Alexandria, Egypt. Imagine going through that desert bringing your livestock. It was a lot more convenient, a lot more practical to just make the journey and then buy something right there in the temple. However, although these were all good purposes, although the money changers and the sellers of animals had an important contribution to make, the system had become totally corrupt. We see this in our country all the time, right? How often the best of intentions and the best of programs can become corrupted by the greed of mankind. Well, you see the money changers attached a surcharge. Remember when I said my little ATM story in Norway that there was a small fee? Well, I wouldn't call this a small fee. If you were converting currency, they charged 6%. And also, if you had to pay the temple tax, and remember we studied this before, that the temple tax was half a shekel, but there was, um, there was no half shekel coin. Any of you ever see a half penny or a half penny? There used to be a half penny coin, but if something cost a half a cent, you'd have to get change, right? Well, that would happen all the time. If you didn't pay the temple tax in advance and get another person to go with you and pay that full shekel to cover both of you, you had to pay it in the temple. But they charged you 6% for making change. Now, I worked in a deli once when I was 20 years of age. And I didn't like making change at first. I would kind of get messed up in my mind. But after working there for a week, I could make change in a matter of seconds. 6% charge for the inconvenience of giving you a half a shekel back. So you could wind up paying 12%. Now maybe that doesn't sound so bad. We have, we have an inflation tax right now of 8%, right? And it might get to 12%, God forbid. But for a day laborer, for that person that we've talked about many times in this gospel, who is living a hand-to-mouth existence, for the day laborer, a half a day's wage meant that your family was going, going to only have half the food they needed. That's a big deal. Commentator James Montgomery Boyce goes on to point out that the abuses in the animal trading were worse yet. Yes, you could bring your own animal. In fact, that was how the law of Moses described it in the book of Deuteronomy, that you were to go and bring a lamb or a ram from your flocks. However, we also see that that sacrificial animal was to be without blemish. And here's the scam. If you took really good care of your animal, if you were really careful and you made sure that it didn't go off-roading, it didn't get hurt, it didn't get injured. When you brought it to the priests, they always found a blemish. There was always some little nick, some little cut, some little spot where the fur or wool ran the wrong way, and they would always reject your animal and require you to buy another. Well, maybe that seems like a little bit of a bummer, especially if you've been carrying a bunch of pigeons with you. So now I have to buy, I'm poor, and all I have is two pigeons. And I need to now, because the priest has rejected my pigeons, I need to buy some additional pigeons there at the temple. The cost of pigeons inside the temple, 50 times as much as anywhere else. It was a scam. It was a graft. And when we look at Jesus' reaction and the vitriol that we see from the loving Savior, understand how offended he was by these practices. Now, in just a few sentences, we're going to see how in just a few words, just a couple of verses, how many prophecies of Scripture Jesus quotes and fulfills. I could never do what Jesus does. How he jumps from numerous biblical texts and pulls them all together. For example, Zechariah the prophet prophesies a time where there would be no traders 
no merchants in God's house. And in Zechariah 14, 21, we read, and every pot in Jerusalem and Judah will be holy to the Lord of hosts, so that all who sacrifice may come and take of them and boil the meat of the sacrifice in them. And there shall no longer be a traitor in the house of the Lord of hosts on that day. And in Isaiah 56, 7, Isaiah looks forward to a time where there will be no traitors, but instead there will be prayers. These I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in the house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Once again, do you see the very words of our text being woven in? These prophecies tell us of God's will, God's purpose for his house. They point towards a future temple. It is the temple that will be built during the millennial reign of Jesus. It is the temple that is described in the book of Ezekiel, where Jesus will ensure that his father's house is permanently set in order. But our text does not take place in that future millennial temple. It takes place in Herod's monstrosity, which Jesus alludes to. Clearly, in our text, Jesus is quoting directly from Jeremiah 7.11. Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, I myself have seen it, declares the Lord. 700 years earlier, Jeremiah saw the similar abuses. He saw how God's house had been desecrated in his own time. But with the foresight of the prophet, he saw this day when God's house would be further commercialized. God told him that this would happen, that God's house would be monetized, that it would cease to be a house of prayer. Which leads to my second and briefer point today. The clash with the chief priests and the scribes. Look with me in verses 14 through 17. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise? And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany, and he lodged there. Now, in order to explain this further, let's return to the court of the Gentiles. This enormous court that formed that 25-acre perimeter around the inner courts was not only filled with Gentiles and with merchants, it was also the only place that the blind and the lame were permitted to go. They were not allowed into the inner sanctums of the temple. They were not allowed into the court of the women, into the court of the Israelites. They were not allowed to come into the place where their sins could be atoned for by following the animal sacrifices that had been prescribed in the law of Moses. In fact, there is rabbinical literature where we see that the blind and the lame were actually told, stay home. Don't bother coming. We're not going to let you in. Just save yourself the trip. They were excused from coming to the temple, but many did nonetheless. Now you may remember in Acts chapter 3, how Peter and John, the apostles, meet a man who was born lame at the beautiful gate, and how they heal him and raise him to his feet. This small golden front gate that led into the court of the women, that led into the inner sanctums of the temple that's marked by a red arrow on your screens. This is the beautiful gate. It is where you found the blind and the lame. They got as close as they could to God's presence, even though they were never included and never able to find redemption through the law of Moses. But Jesus came to fulfill the law of Moses. 
Jesus came in order that he could set these wrongs right. This tradition of excluding the blind and the lame was never God's intent. It was built upon a very strange application of an event in the life of King David. In 2 Samuel 5, we read, And the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who said to David, You will not come in here, but the blind and the lame will ward you off, thinking David cannot come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is the city of David. What does that have to do with not allowing blind and lame people into the temple? You see, these verses are historical verses. They describe the last stand of a Canaanite group called the Jebusites, who were the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And they taunted, it's almost like a Monty Python scene. They taunted from the walls that not even their blind people, even their lame people, even their most unqualified and ineffective warriors would be able to keep King David out. Somehow, the Pharisees and the chief priests found justification for separating and excluding the blind and the lame from God's house based on that verse that I just read to you. But once again, Jesus will not submit to their sloppy exegesis, their poor interpretation of the word of God, and he heals the blind and the lame right before their very eyes in the court of the Gentiles. Now this sets up a serious clash with the scribes and the Pharisees on two levels. First of all, the scribes and the Pharisees had no compassion for the blind and the lame. They preferred them being on the outside looking in. And Jesus messed with their intention. But on top of it, we see that there is this moment that really lights things up where the children begin to praise Jesus. You know, children are wonderfully imitative. And I think we can all think of a time when we look to our right or our left when our kiddos were small and you see them doing whatever you're doing. I remember growing up with this public service announcement and it was all about this guy who's washing his car and he's cleaning the hubcap. And then you look and the little boy has a squirt gun and he's cleaning the other hubcap. Whatever the dad did, he did. And then... The man lit up a cigarette, and the little boy starts reaching for the pack. Any of you old enough to remember that PSA? You know, I think that this should be a constant reminder of us that we are living our lives under ever-watchful eyes. Children, our grandchildren, the children of our church are watching us. On the day that we now call Palm Sunday, Jewish worshipers exalted Jesus. And they called him the son of David, a messianic term. And they begged him with the word that in the Greek is Hosanna, in the Hebrew is Hosheana. It is a word of plea. Save us, we pray. Save us right now. But the children were there. And they're back again the next day. And they see Jesus doing things that they might not have expected him to do. They see him turning over the tables of the money changers. They see him driving out the merchants. They may be wondering, is Jesus a good guy or a bad guy? Then he starts healing lame people. And they're up and they're walking and they're dancing around and they're praising God. And then these people who are blinded, who are begging for alms, and all of a sudden, these same people are rejoicing. And they are clearly running around because they can see where they're going. And as the children see this, all doubt is removed, and they repeat the words they heard their parents say the previous day. Hosanna to the son of David. But notice how the chief priests and the pharisaical scribes are untouched by any of this. They're untouched by the healing miracles. Imagine if we were in church today and all of a sudden a lame person started walking, a blind person started praising God because they could see again. But these scribes and Pharisees are untouched and they're unmoved by the sincere praise of children. When you get to the point 
where the praise of children annoys you, where the praise of children distracts you, where you wish they would shut up and be silent, you are far from the heart of Jesus. Because Jesus delighted in the praise and the worship of these children. You see, the Pharisees and the scribes, they're the true blind men in our story. They are the ones who Jesus, in Matthew chapter 23, will refer to as blind guides. They are blinded by their hatred of Jesus because he doesn't play by their rules. And indignantly, they confront Jesus. Don't you hear what they're saying? And Jesus' response is masterful. And I've shared this with you before. Don't get into an argument with Jesus. Because what happens? You lose every time. The succinctness of Jesus' response is just awesome to me. Out of the mouths of infants and nursing babes, you have prepared praise. Once again, Jesus is quoting a scripture. And remember that these men had at an early age memorized the word of God. They memorized the whole Old Testament. That's how they came to be scribes and Pharisees. They read it all, but they knew nothing. And here are the words that we find that Jesus is quoting from. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babies and infants you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. There's no reply. We've seen this again and again in Matthew's gospel. Jesus speaks and people shut up. Because how do you come back to a reply like that? And Jesus walks away from them and he goes to Bethany. And they will go on their way more determined than ever to kill Jesus. But I'd like to close today with two application points. In our text, we've seen how Jesus embraced the full counsel of God's word. That he fulfilled the prophecies of scripture, including the most important one that I did not quote, Psalm 69, 9. Zeal for your house consumes me. Jesus also demonstrates both compassion and judgment. Healing the lame and the blind yet forcibly overthrowing the corrupt. You know, in our century, we have a tendency to embrace easily the gentle Jesus and to distance ourselves from the Jesus who whipped people into shape, literally. Listen to these words by one of my favorite seminary professors, Grant Osborne. When a church exists for comfort to the exclusion of challenge, for grace and not ever for judgment, she becomes a hideout for thieves rather than a house of God. She also abandons the faithful exposition of scripture, which regularly treats both grace and judgment. And we are seeing this drama play out in our century, but also in our community right now. Churches, many churches have backed away from preaching or teaching about the hard truths of Scripture. They only preach the good stuff, what they decide is the good stuff. And I've shared with you what's happening to them, and you can check it out on Barna or Gallup or any polling organization. They are hemorrhaging members by the millions because they're not following Jesus' example. Jesus always spoke truth. He spoke the easy and lovely truths. He spoke the hard truths. And down deep, people are searching for truth, not pleasantries. People will not get up early on a Sunday morning, get dressed up like this, or casually, and come and drive to church only to hear some mealy-mouthed message. People are hungry for truth. One more application in the form of a very uncomfortable question with which I close. What in your life do you need Christ to drive out so that you can worship him in purity and truth? Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, you have called upon us to worship you in spirit and in truth. And Lord, that is our heart's desire today. 
And Lord, we would be the first to confess to you that we have seen the ways in which your house has been commercialized and monetized. It should anger us more than it does because we know how much this angered you. You want your Father's house to be a house of prayer. Our church needs to be a house of prayer. Help us, Lord, to approach you in that way. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we celebrate the Lord's Supper today, um, we're going to do something that we've done just once before now on Good Friday, and that is that we want to go and give you a choice. We know that some of you are still most comfortable receiving the Lord's Supper using one of these kits, and we want to encourage you, if that's what you're comfortable with, we have kits up front here. But some of you have been longing to get back to the way things were, and if you prefer to go and take the bread and dip it in the common cup, we'd welcome you to do that as well. Kind of learned from communion yesterday, and that was that half the people went up and they dipped the cup, the other half came back to their <laughs> seats holding their cups, waiting us for to say, to say something else. I'd like us to receive together. So I'm gonna encourage you, if you choose to use one of the kits, go and open it, take a few moments, we're not in a rush, and let's receive at the table so that we receive together. But Ryan and Pastor Ryan and I want to just go and share the words that Jesus said. The Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread and he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. And on the night which Jesus was betrayed, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant that is in my blood. Drink it, all of you, in remembrance of me of me. May we remember the Lord's sacrifice before we come to his table. Lord's table is open now. You can come down the side aisles so that we don't wind up colliding with each other. We'll exit down the middle. For those of you in our overflow area, um, you're a smaller group. You can just come to the table as you would like. The table is open. <laughs>
Yes, I will for all my 
yes I will as you go out this week may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your body soul and spirit be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ he who calls you church is faithful and he will surely do it amen amen Thank you.